Um, thank you, Victor, and thanks for uh, being here today. Um, I'm very passionate about technology, very passionate about entrepreneurship, and, uh, and I have been on a journey for 30 years uh, as a startup guy. And uh, what I'd like to do today is share with you some of the key lessons that I've learned over the past 30 years. Um, some of those lessons I wish I had known 30 years ago when I was just getting started. Um, and I like to try to pass uh, backwards um, to, uh, to anyone that I have a chance to talk with um, some of those key lessons uh, and some of those mistakes and uh, missteps that um, were pretty costly. And uh, I wish I could have avoided them. Um, but sometimes you learn a lot of uh, important lessons from missteps and failure. So um, I have no regrets about you know, the last 30 years as an entrepreneur, um, other than uh, too bad I didn't know some of these lessons earlier. So uh, thank you, Victor, for inviting us to speak at this conference. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure that people, uh, topics, are the biggest draw at an open source tech conference. Um, I went to the first open source business conference in San Francisco about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that Clayton Christensen spoke at and talked about disruptive technology and application stacks and what happens when, uh, you know, somebody open sources this and then, you know, everybody in the ecosystem has to kind of go up one, one step in the stack. And I love that kind of uh, conversation that kind of conversation about amazing technology, disruptive business models, and kind of value creation for people on this planet. Um, but as I've come to review my life and my career, I realized that 25, 30 years ago, as I was getting started, I was overlooking the most important element in any effort, in any, in any mission, in any purpose, in any cause, in any business, and I'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. So um, many of you uh, uh, might have thought that Paul Allen, the Microsoft founder, owner of the Trailblazers and the Seattle Supersonics and the biggest yacht, one of the biggest yachts in the world, uh, might be speaking to you today. Sorry, uh, I am not that Paul Allen. I am uh, Paul Allen. <coughs> The Lesser, uh, I was nicknamed that by the venture capitalists in Utah about 15 years ago, and I blogged under that name for uh, about 10 years actively. So I'm proudly Paul Allen The Lesser. Um, I've thanked my mother many, many times for naming me Paul Allen, because when I lived in Silicon Valley, guess what? Everybody returned my calls. Uh, it was a nice door opener. Now, my mom passed away about a year ago. And this is a photo of her with my grandmother who passed away in 1999 at age 104 with 500 descendants. My grandmother Israelson from North Logan, Utah had over 500 children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren and spouses who married into the family before she passed away. And as I was saying goodbye to my mom, uh, as we kind of parted company for the time being, I gained a great perspective about what matters most in life. I'm telling you, it's not the wealth, it's not the achievements, it's the relationships that you form, particularly with your family. And so I'm grateful for all that my mom and her mom did to invest in family relationships, which are very, very powerful uh, to me and my family today. So Alex Haley, the famous author of Roots, which turned into a blockbuster miniseries in the 70s. Raise your hand if you saw the miniseries Roots in the 1970s. 110, 120 million households watched that miniseries featuring Kunta Kinte and the Africans who were enslaved and, and who had this multi-generational epic story. Well, Alex Haley, the brilliant author of that book turned miniseries, said that in all of us, there is a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we came from. And so as I think about Ancestry.com's impact around the world with tens of millions or potentially hundreds of millions of people getting a little bit better sense of who they are and where they came from, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool thing that technology can scale to that level and can affect people personally. Every time I speak around the world, I have members of the audience come up to me afterwards in tears because they have an Ancestry.com story. 
They have a DNA test that just revealed something and they found a family member they never knew about. Or they found a, a great grandparent that they, they had lost um, information about and, and now, now all of a sudden they have a family story and they relate to that story and it's changing their identity as a human being. And so as I speak around the world, I like to make sure that each of us realize how important it is to know your family story because part of your identity is who you are descended from. Um, but another big part of the identity is who you are and what talents you have, what strengths you have, what uniqueness you have as a human being. And so today I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey as an entrepreneur uh, trying to grow into the uh, a title of Paul Allen the Lesser. And uh, Vic Victor and I talked about, you know, potentially, uh, I've started eight companies, but I'd like to share with you a couple anecdotes about four different versions of Paul Allen the Entrepreneur and the evolution that I've gone through to get where I am today. So Paul Allen version 1.0, 1990, co-founded a business, CD-ROM publishing, floppy disk publishing, electronic publishing business with my best friend. Neither of us had had a single business class or technology class in our entire life. Uh, I had learned how to program uh, in BASIC when I was 12. My dad bought an Apple II computer. I used to code in BASIC and I used to save my code onto a cassette tape. Uh, so Phil, I don't know, you probably predated me. Maybe you did punch cards. I never did punch cards, but I did cassette tape memory. And I could write, I wrote a 2800 line D&D uh, simulation program. And then I wrote a BYU football uh, uh, program that I could, you know, call the plays and see what happened randomly. I loved randomness. Um, but so for um, early in my life, I did a little bit of coding. Then I was a Russian major in college and really never knew nothing about business or technology. And, but decided in 1990 to build a product that I was personally in love with. I wanted to build a collection of all the best books ever written in every subject of human knowledge, starting with religion and education, history, literature, science. All the best books in the world should be available digitally on floppy disk, CD-ROM, and then of course years later the internet emerged. So um, that was our first attempt and my Paul Allen 1.0 entrepreneur brain hadn't fully developed yet and uh, all we really did was um, build a product that was cool. Uh, I hired my sister-in-law as our first employee to do our bookkeeping. She had no booking, bookkeeping experience. Hired my brother, hired my co-founder's brother. Whoever would show up and say they would work for us, we would hire them without regard to their skills or their talent. And so it's no surprise that about every year we had a big annual layoff. Uh, at Christmas time, the joke was that Dan and I would come to the Christmas party with a whole new cast of employees because we had no idea what we were doing. We just loved to build a product, and it was a good product, but we didn't understand financial forecasting or life cycle of revenue or um, how to hire for talent. We just didn't know. Our brains hadn't fully developed yet with, in that regard. Um, so in uh, early 90s, I was programming in Turbo Pascal, uh, the ultimate Pascal development environment, uh, built a CD-ROM product that sold 100,000 or more copies. We made the Inc. 500, and my entrepreneurial brain began to develop a little bit. I went to Philadelphia in May of 95, where we were honored as one of the five, sorry, May of 96, one of the 500 fastest growing companies in the United States. And at that event, I realized these 500 entrepreneurs are pretty dang awesome people and they're creating jobs, and they're building businesses, and I was inspired by them, and I thought, I'm not just a product person. I wanna be a great entrepreneur. So my entrepreneur journey went to a whole new level, and my entrepreneur, um, so my 1.0 entrepreneur operating system was product first. Paul Allen 2.0, 1995, I got a high-speed satellite dish in Provo, Utah, Hughes Network, had high-speed internet for the, for the rest of my life. So I was one of the first people I ever knew that had high-speed internet. I would stay up till two o'clock every night reverse engineering the internet marketing strategies of thousands of dot-com companies. I was obsessed with all the dot-com companies that were raising amazing amounts of venture capital, building web-based businesses that were incredibly scalable. 
Amazon.com launched, launched an associate program in 1997 or 8. So I flew to New York and I went to the first ever um, affiliate conference where Be Free and Commission Junction and other companies that were building affiliate management software introduced what they were doing. So Ancestry.com was founded in 96, 97. We launched our affiliate program in 98. By 2003, it was accounting for 35% of our new subscribers because we were pioneers in affiliate marketing, which is one of the best business models of all time. And so I love being an early adopter. I love reading Product Hunt every day and seeing what are the coolest new things that are going on. I just, I love new tech, new marketing, new business models. And so Paul Allen 2.0 was pretty obsessed with becoming a successful dot-com. And so we started raising venture capital. In late 98, we raised $12.3 million. The next year we raised $30 million at a way bigger valuation. The next year we raised $33 million before the dot-com bubble burst. We had a $300 million valuation. And as a company, we were so excited about raising capital, building a business, and going public. Now, today, you can read articles about how Ancestry made a fortune for Spectrum Equity. In fact, the highest return of any growth fund in the last 20 years came from the company that bought Ancestry.com in 2006. As a founder, I had no vote as to whether we were going to sell the company to a private equity fund. We were so funding focused that we raised so much capital that we lost control of the business within the first two years. And so venture capitalists own and control the board. Private equity comes in, wants to pay a huge amount of money. The board votes and Ancestry.com has been in the hands of private equity um, mostly ever since. And so uh, Paul Allen 2.0 was capital first. So we see what happens if capital becomes the kind of driving force in the company's culture. So Paul Allen 3.0, I left Ancestry in 2002, started a couple more businesses. By 2007, I was pretty excited about new platforms that were emerging. I fly to San Francisco and I meet Mark Zuckerberg the day that he announced his Facebook platform. Facebook only had 24 million users at the time. But I knew as a BYU s a professor that almost all of my students thought Facebook was the most important site that they used. And so a college study out of UCLA showed that 50% of college-age women said Facebook was their most important website, and 33% of college-age men said Facebook was their most important website. So I go to meet Zuckerberg. He announces Facebook platform. He says, we are going to open up our platform for third-party app developers, and we're going to create an even playing field. Every app can compete with our own apps. We've got a photo app. We will have video apps. We have all kinds of apps, but your apps can compete with ours because we want our users to have the best experience on Facebook. You get to keep 100% of all the ad revenue that you generate from your apps. So after Zuckerberg sat down from that announcement, I got on the phone with my head of engineering, my head of product, and I said, we're changing our business strategy. We're not gonna build a destination website for families anymore like we were planning at familylink.com. We're gonna build Facebook apps for families. So within uh, another year or so, we had launched an app called We're Related. It was the second most viral app on Facebook next to the games. Uh, next to Causes, it was the most uh, viral uh, social app. And uh, we got 20 plus million active users. We had 120 million users of our app. Disney came to us and said, hey, you're the most family friendly app on Facebook. We'd like, you to, we'd like to sell all of your advertising inventory for you. So Disney entered into a partnership with us to monetize our incredible app. Well, you've heard the phrase, live by the platform, die by the platform. In late 2009 and continuing into 2010, Facebook basically cut off all of the viral channels for app developers and then disconnected app developers from all of their end users. We could no longer send a notification or message to our 120 million users. We lost 97% of our traffic and 98% of our revenue. I had to lay off 40 people. You live by the platform, you die by the platform. And the lesson learned from Paul Allen 3.0 is platform first doesn't always work. 
Now, Paul Allen 4.0, hopefully a new and improved version. Not all 4.0 versions are better than the previous ones. My favorite BlackBerry of all time was the 1999 version that was super mini. It only had a four-line four screen, and it was, so, it was like a pager, but had a great keyboard, and you could text, and you could email, and it was awesome, and it fit. You didn't even notice it in your pocket. By the time BlackBerry did their 10th or 12th version, it was terrible. All they had was iPhone Envy. They wanted bigger screen and more touch screen, and they ruined their keyboard, and they ruined the use case. WordPerfect 4.1 was the best version of WordPerfect ever invented. After that, it became a kitchen sink where they're throwing in this and this and this, and all the ease of use and efficiency of WordPerfect was kind of diminished after that. <clears throat> so not all 4.0 versions are better than 1.0. Hopefully, in the case of Paul Allen. Uh, 4.0, um, we're improving, uh, at least that's the goal. Um, I've spent the last five years getting kind of a massive education in how important people are in every aspect of business, how important culture is in every organization in the world. Not that all organizations have good cultures. There's toxic cultures everywhere. And human beings pay an enormous cost for toxic cultures. And so um, how is it that in the 25 years before I joined Gallup that I never noticed that Peter Drucker, the greatest business management guru in the 20th century, said a long time ago in the 60s, I believe, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How is it that I had missed that Peter Drucker and so many other great thinkers have said over decades that what matters most in organizations is people. Technology matters. Marketing matters. Business models matter. All those things matter. Platforms matter. But what matters by far more than anything else in a sustainable company that has a mission to perform is the people. And so for the last six years, I've been in Gallup, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, learning all about talent and strengths and potential and great managers versus what our CEO calls managers from hell. 50% of Americans have quit a job because of a terrible manager. Most people get, a, get um, promoted to manager because they were a great individual performer without regard to any of their personal skills or managerial skills. Gallup's studies show that only 10% of people have the natural talent to be a great manager. And another 20% on top of that can be trained to become good managers. But 70% of people should never be a direct manager because they're not talented and wired in a way that will help their employees grow and thrive and perform. Some managers compete against their employees. Some managers withhold information. Some managers want the power or the prestige or the higher pay without regard to whether they can help these human beings that spend time with them every day grow and develop and flourish. The number one best-selling book in the history of Amazon is Strength Finder 2.0. And it's not a book, it's a movement. It is a movement that is necessary because so much of our education system and our workplace system is about standardizing people and marching them through a factory model of education. Somebody decided what you're going to learn, when you're going to learn it, how you're going to learn it, and you have to learn it in lockstep with everybody else without regard to the innate talent that you brought to that place in the, in the first place. And so the movement of strengths, inspired by a brilliant psychologist named Don Clifton, is all about first start with what your innate talents are. Now, think about your brain. Many of you know this. You've studied neuroscience, perhaps, as you study uh, neural networks and machine learning and kind of the, you know, some of the great computer scientists in the, even the 50s were comparing the brain to computers. Well, your brain is more powerful than any supercomputer because it's such a general purpose device. You have 100 billion cells, 100 billion neurons in your brain. You have 100 trillion synaptic connections. That is an incredibly powerful thing that you have on your head. And yet, nobody gives your parents or your teachers or your managers an operating system that tells you what your neurological pathways wired you to do very well. There are innate talents that each one of us have that we've been born with or that we've nurtured over our life. And we have these incredible capacities and most people don't know what they are. And most of the people we work with don't know what they are. So Paul Allen 4.0 is on a mission 
to help every organization, hopefully, that we can reach around the world to put people first, to start with talent, because everyone has amazing talent. Don Clifton said, if you take 10,000 people in a room, every one of you is better at something than the other 9,999 people. Let's just find out what it is and give you a role that allows you to do that over and over, get recognized and rewarded for it, and flourish as a human being. When Peter Drucker was asked about Americans understanding their strengths, he says, most of them don't know what their strengths are. When you ask them, they look at you with a blank stare, or they answer in terms of subject knowledge, which is the wrong answer. We did a survey, as, as Victor mentioned, uh, less than 20% of you can articulate what your greatest strengths are. 22.5% of you can articulate the strengths of the people that you work with. Okay, so there's a deficit of understanding. Shakespeare said, know thyself. Peter Drucker said, I'll get to this in a second. Well, I thought the next slide was coming up. Okay, why do we focus on what's wrong with ourselves and others without regard to knowing what our strengths and talents are? Well, it might stem back to Sigmund Freud, the very famous um, or infamous psychologist of the late 1800s. He is the father of psychoanalysis and, uh, analysis, and Sigmund Freud was obsessed with finding out what is wrong with you. Where did you get screwed up? Lie down on this couch and answer questions and I will find clues to why you're so disturbed and what is wrong with you. And then I'll try to fix you. So the field of psychology largely is around diagnosing what's wrong with us and trying to fix us rather than identifying our native capabilities. There's a diagnostic um, and statistical manual of disorders that is thousands of pages long. It's in its fifth edition. I'm afraid to open that book up because I probably find myself on a bunch of those pages. There's probably things wrong with me. Now, thankfully, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists can identify serious mental illnesses. I have a brother with schizophrenia and I'm thankful for the healthcare providers who have helped diagnose his issues and medicate and provide support and, and help so that he can live as normal a life as possible. But the vast majority of human beings can be very healthy and not have to live their life defined by a mental illness. And yet, most of us don't know what's right with us. So in 1952, Don Clifton, the father of strength psychology, a growing, burgeoning field, and the, he's the grandfather of positive psychology, which is also expanding all over the globe. He asked a simple question, 1952. He spent 51 years of his life trying to answer that question, which was, what would happen if we thought about what's right with people instead of what's wrong with them? So Don Clifton uh, who was the former chairman of the Gallup organization in Washington, D.C., invented StrengthsFinder before he died. And now almost 20 million people have discovered their top five strengths by taking a simple 30-minute online assessment. It gives them a vocabulary. It gives them top five words that they can think about and find ways to use those strengths every day throughout their life. Gallup is a polling organization, as you know, and they've done polls all over the world. One of the polls they've done in many countries is, what do you do as a parent if your child comes home with a report card that has mostly A's and one F? Guess what? 94% of parents immediately jump on the kid and, and talk about the F. And guess what happens to the kid's brain? Fight or flight mode, they don't hear a thing the parent says. Why do we ignore the celebration of several A's and a couple of B's and talk with the child about, hey, what do you love about that class? You got an A in English. That's fantastic. Why don't we celebrate that for a few minutes before we try to figure out a strategy to figure out why did you get an F in gym? But as an instinct, we think it's a reflection on us. We think there's something terribly wrong. It turns out there are a lot of great stories of children who didn't do well in school and who went on to achieve incredible things, such as Steven Spielberg, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Miserable student. Lots of other examples of terrible students. Guess what? You're not defined by a grade. Why does a parent have to look at some letter on a card and jump all over their child because they did badly in one thing? Who decided that, that that was important to them in the first place? I'm not giving all children excuses not to try, but I am saying that the rigid structure is backfiring. 
Don Clifton wrote a book in 1992. I highly recommend it. It's called Soar With Your Strengths. He introduced this whole new theory of thinking and seeing the world through the lens of what's right with every human being. I've grown to be a huge admirer of Don Clifton. I hope his philosophy spreads to the entire world. So what if we looked at ourselves and others through the lens of strengths? Peter Drucker, again, the great management guru, said that the first secret of effectiveness is to understand the people you work with so that you can make use of their strengths. So if only 22% of you know the strengths and can articulate the strengths of your teammates, guess what? You got work to do. You need to start studying what's right with everybody you work with. Start noticing things you didn't notice before and start making use of their strengths as they make use of yours. Tom Rath, the the uh, author of StrengthsFinder 2.0 and Strengths-Based Leadership, uh, grandson of Don Clifton, said that maybe the single greatest talent is being able to spot talent in somebody that they hadn't seen before. Think about that. Did you ever have a parent or a teacher or a friend that noticed some talent that you had and said something? And it caused a change in your own perception of yourself. It actually gave you confidence. It boosted your self-efficacy. And from that point on, you were a different human being. We can give that gift to our children, to our coworkers, to everybody we meet if we become a talent spotter. If we see something positive and we say something, it can actually change the course of that person's life forever. Dr. Stephen Covey, one of the great thinkers and, and leaders of the 20, 20th century, said that one of the most important things we can do as people is to affirm other people, to believe in them, and to see their innate potential. So Don Clifton, Stephen Covey, uh, Peter Drucker, other great leaders and thinkers have all said the same thing, and many of us haven't been listening because our heads are in screens or we're looking at our computer or we're going to marketing or ICO conferences or whatever it is that we're doing, we're ignoring the most important element in all of our lives, which is the people. The positive impact of a strengths-based approach is really incredible. Sheryl Sandberg brought StrengthsFinder to Facebook in 2009. Thousands of employees took StrengthsFinder. In 2012, when she was on a book tour for Lean In, her amazing book about women in the workplace, she was asked by the New York Times, what's the most impactful book you've read in recent years? And she said, now discover your strengths by Don Clifton and Marcus Buckingham. She said, at Facebook, we focus on what people's natural strengths are and spend our management time trying to find ways for them to use those strengths every day. Facebook has become a strengths-based organization. Oxford's Handbook of Positive and Organizational Psychology has a report that says that the single most important way to improve the manager-employee relationship is for the manager to start taking a strengths-based approach rather than being critical and negative, or even worse, rather than ignoring the people that they manage. That's even worse to a person's well-being. Our lead investor in our new company, Soar.com, is uh, Graham Weston, a uh, billionaire from San Antonio, Texas, founder of Rackspace, or, or one of the earliest investors and later CEO of Rackspace, sold for $4 billion. A San Antonio cloud computing company that's worth billions of dollars. Not Silicon Valley, not Seattle. It's an amazing story. Guess what? In 2002, he brought StrengthsFinder to his 150 employees. Years later, they had 7,000 employees. Every single person knew their top five strengths, knew the top five strengths of every other person. It was on their employee badge. Every team they formed over the past 15 years was based on this, the complementary strengths of other people on the team. Graham Weston has a great phrase, and this applies to all of us, and I think as we promote strengths throughout the world, this is what I want everyone to a, a, adapt or adopt as their mantra. Every person wants to be a valued member of a winning team on an inspired mission. Graham Weston told me a couple months ago he doesn't know a single person who does, hasn't taken StrengthsFinder 2.0 and knows their top five strengths. He's donated it to the schools in San Antonio. He's given it to his faith community. He's, he's given it to all the employees and their families at Rackspace. So he's spreading this philosophy that is so positive and powerful. So why am I a strengths evangelist after five years at Gallup? Well, because engagement throughout life as measured by Gallup's famous engagement surveys goes from fifth grade where it's really high. 76% of fifth graders are very engaged in their life. They love school. They love what they're learning. By ninth grade, it goes down. Twelfth grade, it goes down further. And in the workplace, it's even worse. 
adult engagement levels decline over our lifetimes instead of accelerating and, and climbing as we discover our capacities and, and have fulfilling experiences in life. The Desert News had an article not too long ago showing the steep rise of the deaths of despair where people are committing suicide. They're taking their own lives or they're having overdoses with heroin or other opioids. It's a crisis. It's a huge crisis. Why is there so much despair and why is it growing? And so our hope as we spread the strengths movement is that we can accomplish more of this you're three times more likely to report having a high quality of life if you know what your strengths are and you get to use them every day. You're six times more likely to be engaged in your job if you get to use your strengths every day. And so why don't we just use them? Why do we ignore them? Why do we focus on fixing what's wrong with us, which is a really hard thing to do? Um, it's much easier to embrace your natural talent and run with it. Don't try to be somebody else. I remember Josh James was an investor in my previous company, and I've known Josh for 20 years. And Josh is a powerful, dynamic, charismatic leader and entrepreneur. And I remember after multiple meetings with him, I would come away feeling like crap. He was giving me advice. He's giving me stories. And I'm like, yeah, you're awesome, and I suck because I could never do what you do. I, I can't go hire my top competitors, top salespeople, and, you know, he's, he's done amazing, gutsy things in his career. I, I hope Domo has a successful IPO. I'm kind of worried about it, but if I'm comparing myself to him, guess what? I lose. If I compare myself to me and say, what kind of entrepreneur can I be? I can be an encyclopedia, library-loving, book-buying, research-oriented, hyper-growth entrepreneur. I can do that, but I can't be a Josh James type entrepreneur. And if any of us try to be what somebody else is, we're not gonna succeed. But if we try to figure out who we are and embrace the very greatest talents and traits that we have, and then invest heavily in those, we can become world-class at something. We can stand out, we can make a difference. We can be recognized and rewarded for our contribution. Because guess what? This world needs all of our talents. Because if we don't collectively share our talents with each other, the whole world loses. So put people first in your company and make sure you work in organizations that care about people. They're not willing to exploit and dehumanize people, burn developers out 100 hours a week for two years, and then you lose your health. Let's, let's, let's avoid things like that. There are CEOs and CFOs all across the country having debates about, well, what if we invest in training our people and then they leave? And the CEOs, hopefully enlightened CEOs, will say, well, what if we don't invest in training our people and then they stay? So hopefully more uh, executives will invest in their people. Too, too many people wonder if people are an asset or a liability. I've heard countless stories about large corporations who think about people as messy. And it would be nice if we could replace them with robots and with AI. Wouldn't that be great? Well, thankfully, there are some amazing examples of entrepreneurs and CEOs who actually do put people first. You got Kurt Vonnegut in 1952 predicting under his novel player piano that the time would come when machines would replace humans in almost every job. Okay, 1952, the first thinker to imagine a world, a dystopia where no humans have any work to do. Uh, Rise of the Robots, Martin Ford, a recent book is showing how disruptive AI and robots are. And yet there are, there are amazing people. This 36-year-old Asian immigrant is the founder of Boxed.com. It's worth billions. He was able to replace 75% of his warehouse workers in four warehouses with robots. And guess what? He didn't lay off a single person. Instead, he doubled down and he said, all these robots make us more efficient. We're going to take the efficiency gains, invest in these 75% of my employees who no longer do that same job. I'm going to train them to do other things. I'm going to have them go up the stack. Guess what else? He offered college scholarships to all those warehouse workers' children. So this young immigrant is setting the perfect tone for future CEOs in this country. Don't lay off workers because of AI and robots. Double down and invest in your people. Train them to do more, to be more, and to flourish as human beings. And actually invest in their families at the same time. Another great CEO, Bob Chapman, weathered the 2008 financial crisis. He lost 30% of his manufacturing orders overnight. 
and everyone said, you gotta, you gotta cut 30% of your workforce. Guess what? He didn't cut a single person. He got the whole group together and says, we're all gonna take voluntary furloughs this year, four weeks unpaid, starting with me. He didn't lay off a single person. They weathered the storm. They didn't have any human casualties as a result. You know what's scary? Layoffs statistically result in deaths. Heart attacks and other health issues become so pronounced when you have massive layoffs that people actually die as a result of layoffs. I would like every board of CEOs and CFOs in this country, before they do a mass layoff, to look at the human cost, including the deaths that are gonna result statistically from their decision to lay off 1,000 to 5,000 people. Why can't we put people first in our corporations like the open source community does where it's not about money, it's about the effect, it's the cause, it's the mission, it's the impact that you're gonna have for good in the world. We can make strengths-based families, schools, businesses, communities, states, and countries, and together we can make a strengths-based world. One final thing, if you fill out the survey before or after this meeting, you and your organization have a chance to win a one-hour coaching session from Kathy Kirsten, one of the finest strengths coaches on the planet. She worked with Rackspace for seven years. She's currently coaching seven, so 100 Facebook engineers. She understands tech people. She understands the talent you have and the talents you might want to have, but she's a phenomenal coach. And so I encourage you to uh, give us your feedback on the survey, and uh, we invite you to learn more about strengths. And now I'll turn the time over to uh, Christy. I can use this, okay. if it's working. Is this on? Yes. Okay, I'll just hold that. Can you hear well? Okay, um, I'm just gonna just tag off of what Paul was saying, but I wanna hold him up here for just a second because I just wanna give you some examples of some success stories of this. Um, first of all, uh, I wanna talk about a, there was a, I think you should tell this story. <laughs> um, there, it was a, a partners that were not successful in, fi in finding the clients that they needed for their company working together, the problem that they had was one of them was extremely outgoing, sort of the Josh James type, and the other one had this complex feeling very unqualified and feeling like he could not he, he could not do anything for the success of this. After um, taking the assessment and being trained by Paul, um, they found out that one of them had strengths that were very outgoing, that, that, that were very easy to see. The other one had very relationship-based strengths. He was very good at, at you know, one-on-ones and those types of things, but he had never seen those or valued them as strengths. But when he was able to take this assessment and see that was the case, the one who was very outgoing said, you know, I can get us in the door, but I can't do anything after that. I'm, I, I have real anxiety, actually, about continuing the conversation past that point. So once they discovered this, they found one of them could get in the, in the door and the other one could establish the relationship with the people who he felt very comfortable doing that with. Um, what was the result of that? You tell them three successful, the first night they had three successful um, re repeat appointments and before that, that was, that was unheard of. So three successes in a row in, in that industry. Okay, so thank you. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, if I, I am as low tech as it comes, so I am so out of my element here. So Paul might have to stay here and just make sure, is that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I also just want to talk about, if you understand what your strengths are, you also understand that everybody else's strengths don't look like yours. That Don Clifton actually discovered that as we discover our strengths, we can also call that sort of the lens that we see through. Um, the way, the lens that we use to make our decisions to, the, that affects our personality, that affects everything we do in our life. So once you understand that, you can also start to understand that other people's lenses are different from yours. And instead of wanting to have to be like them or being annoyed by them because they think differently from you, you start to understand that they are seeing it completely different than you are. They are coming at life from a completely different angle than you are. 
Um, so we're going to play a little game here just to show you that you are seeing things different than the people around you, okay? Um, so what I want, we're going to have, we're going to make you stand up. What I want is, um, I, this isn't moving, will you come back up? Um, I want you to stand up if when you get to the elevator you push the button a couple times to make sure it remembers that you're there. Stand up. Okay. Next one. You can sit down. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. A list of things to do and stick to it. Yeah. Stand up now if you write a list and you stick to it every single time, no matter what. Stand up if, stay standing if you write a list and you stick to it even on the weekends and holidays. Stand up if you write a, if you get to the end of the day and you do something that wasn't on your list, so you put it on your list so that you can check it off. Everyone's down. <laughs> okay. Stand up if you find someone to race with when you're on the, when you're in a car or any time. You just always need someone to compete with. Okay, I want you guys to realize, thank you, these are actually strengths. This is, this is, you're a competitive person. Each one of these strengths has something to contribute to a family, to a relationship, to a work situation, to a partnership in a, in a work situation. And competition, that is a huge strength. Now, you may have gotten beat up for it, if that is something that you, you know, maybe, maybe racing on the freeway isn't the best way to express that strength, but to be able to understand that competition actually is hugely valuable. And if we took all those that were competitive people off the planet, we would be hugely lacking. We need them. We need them to use that strength in a way that is beneficial to the people around them. Okay, stand up if you need, if you need to find a familiar face at a party. You feel more comfortable talking to a familiar face at a party. Very nice. Okay, sit down. Stand up if you're comfortable kind of working the room and talking to strangers and, and you actually kind of get energy off of finding the people in the room that you don't know. Okay, isn't it amazing to you? Thank you. You can sit down. Isn't it amazing to you to see that, you know, things that might bring you serious anxiety, other people thrive in? That that actually brings them energy to do those things that you're sitting over there going, oh, heavens, never. Okay, I have to look down at this screen down here. Stand up if you're, if you're skeptical until you're given proof. Okay, that is actually a strength to ask lots of questions to, thank you, you can sit, to um, now, you know, people might not like you when you uh, are constantly doing that, but to be able to understand that that is... That is a strength. Uh, stand up if you trust your intuition. You just, your gut tells you and you go by that. <laughs> now, sometimes the people that uh, need proof and those who follow intuition, those, those, those are very, they're different people. Sometimes it can be the same person, but a lot of times it's different people. So those who trust their intuition might get frustrated with those who need proof all the time and say, why can't you just go with your gut? And those who need proof all the time are a little, uh, they, they, they misunderstand the people that just go with their gut and they think, how can you, you know, be so accepting of what's, you know, what, what needs answers? Uh, stand up if you clean your house apartment or your apartment or your workspace before you can relax. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We've got um, a family member who, yeah, she really can't leave the house until it is in perfect order. Now, that's looked at as a great strength generally in society to be very clean and, and orderly, um, but we're not all that way. We don't all feel that necessary obsession to be clean and to leave something absolutely meticulously clean. Organization. Um, 
arranging. These are all strengths that sometimes we don't realize are strengths. Uh, stand up if you have your life color coded, your closet color coded, or I mean, set in in order of color, in order of okay. Those who are not let the stay standing, those who are not standing, do you, do you look at this and go, oh, oh my gosh, I well I say that because I'm looking at this thinking, you know, <laughs> if they're in the right place, that's good for me. So I admire this strength. Anyway, thank you. Sit down. Stand up if you push the elevator. Uh, I think I already said this, but push the elevator button a couple times to remind you that you were there. I think we did have that slide already. Oh, if you talk to people at the elevator, thank you. I'm blind and I can't see the screen. Okay, stand up if you always know the plot of the movie before the end. Before everybody else does. Do you keep it to yourself? Or do you have a hard time? Or do you actually struggle with movies that are so predictable that you just probably avoid them altogether sometimes because they're so predictable? Thank you. Stand up if you're, if you're accused of being too nice. Okay, now stand up. Well, okay, sit down. Stand up if you're accused of not being nice enough. I just want to say there is, there is a strength called command. And command is willing to address the elephant in the room. They, they do not, they're not, I don't want to say they're not sensitive to offending people, but that does not motivate them to stop saying what needs to be said. I always feel like I would like to have a command person next to me all the time to go, will you please tell them what I just can't bring myself to say. We need the command people. But sometimes command people can appear like a bull in a china shop sometimes. But boy, do we need them. They're the, the bullheaded ones who can, uh, who, who have a commanding presence, who say what needs to be said. We have a daughter who we, we were, she was in the room while we were coaching somebody who had command, this strength. And, and it, it, he wasn't, nobody was surprised by this. You're very, you're, you're rarely surprised when you find out what your strengths are. Most of the time, you say, yes, I know that, but you haven't, real, you haven't la titled them as strengths for yourself. But we were coaching somebody who had command, and, and our daughter said, I wish I had command because nobody ever listens to me, and everybody listens to Richard all the time. And we said, you can either try and spend your life trying to be like Richard and have that as a strength where it wasn't for her. In fact, you know, you can look at all of the strengths when you take the assessment and see where they, where they lie for you. This, lie, this was very far down on her list of strengths. So she could spend all the time in the world trying to become that, or she could focus on her top five strengths, and everyone will listen to you by choosing to do what you do well. Gallup and StrengthsFinder has kind of addressed the fact that many of us are trying to be well-rounded. And they would draw a circle on the board and say, you know, many, many people in the world are trying to be this. They're trying to be a little bit good at everything. StrengthsFinder is more like focusing on a star. And they drew a big st a five-point star on the board, and they said, we feel that you will be much more successful if you find those five points of what you are good at and refine those. You will be much more successful in your life than you will be trying to be this well-rounded person. Um, stand up if you love public speaking. You love to be up in front of people and speak. Okay, those that are sitting down, is that shocking to you that there is anybody that actually likes to get up in front of someone and speak? Those who are standing up, do you think, I don't like admitting this, that this is comfortable for me because people might think I am vying for attention or something? No, it's not that. It just is comfortable for you. It doesn't bring anxiety. It, 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 it brings energy. And that is not a bad thing. That is a good thing. Okay, thanks. You can sit down. Um, stand up if you believe that you are a genius at anything. Thank you. Now, that is not common, as Paul has said. 
There is too much of the world that doesn't believe they are a genius at anything. And Gallup has done studies with the Strengths Finder movement to discover that once you know your top five strengths and you know and, and in the order, the, the order that they are in, to find somebody else in the world that has those same top five strengths in that same order, what is the chances? One in 33.4 million. To have your same top five strengths in the same order. And that's not just the people that have taken the test. Taken the test. They've been able to um, figure this out, all of the people on the planet. And if you add uh, your top six strengths or your top seven strengths, it be the, the statistics become lower and lower until there is, no, there is no possibility of anyone else on the planet having the same strengths as you in the same order. Which means Gallup has proven there is nobody else like you. So when you try and be somebody else, or you try and be like somebody else, you are pulling yourself away from what you are naturally good at. Now you have not, might not have been, your strengths might not have been fed in a way that helps you understand that they are strengths, but there is now a way for you to see that. You are all a genius at something. Um, Albert Einstein said, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. So, now, oh, he took it out. Did you take it out? Paul has always said, at the, at the end of this, now that you understand that, you can understand that every single one of us has something that we are, that we are good at. And... Uh, we've been able to do this with our, with each other, with our kids. Um, I've coached a number of people on that. Um, hold on. Yes. What do you mean? Are we done? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's that was 15. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I will stop. Wait. Let me, let me just um, thank Victor again for inviting us. Uh, you know, as I said, 30 years ago, I was oblivious to the people issues, the culture issues, and now I find that it's the greatest and most important thing in my life. And I don't know if all of you believe that or will feel that or will discover that yourself, but I'm grateful for Christy and me doing this together. This is the first time in 30 years of marriage that we've actually been working arm in arm to talk about strengths and to, and to share strengths with our own family and, and everywhere we go and and so it's been uh, it's been a fun journey for us my favorite thing about it is that she has grown to a, a not maybe love or appreciate my one of my strengths but um, she tolerates it way better than she used to. So I have to buy a book on Amazon every single day. I have a library of thousands of books, and I have a, a need. I have learner input and ideation as my top three strengths. And so now when the doorbell rings and it's Amazon dropping off another book, she doesn't get upset or worry about, oh, he's, what is he doing? He's never going to read this book. No, I need the books. Um, and so No, I just have to say we don't have anywhere to put them. <laughs> So we, we've maxed the library. We'll, we'll add on to the house soon enough. Uh, but no, so for her to say Paul's learner and his input have allowed him to have success in his career. If he doesn't constantly learn, he gets bored. And so, and the same with her. She's got empathy and restorative, these two strengths. What I never knew those were really strengths, but I've seen her use those throughout her life. It took me about a year to convince her that those were strengths, that it wasn't a weakness to feel that, uh, emotions of everybody around you and it wasn't a weakness to to have this uh, effort to find problems and solve them she gets great satisfaction from solving problems that's a that's a great strength so our invitation to you is that um, we hope you will all take this seriously learn your strengths and soar with your strengths and then spread the good news that hey there's more to life than despair and worrying what's wrong with us and trying to you know be somebody else it's an exhilarating thing to find out what you were born and designed to do and then to do that. And it's very satisfying and fulfilling. So we invite you to help us build a strengths-based world. Thank you.